In this video, we will be looking at Fermat's last theorem for polynomials. How a mathematician by the name of Lamy thought he had similarly proven Fermat's last theorem, and where it all goes wrong. Let's get right into it. Many of you will have heard of Fermat's last theorem. It's that infamous theorem which Fermat claimed to have proven, but the proof was too long to fit in the margin. Nobody knows if he really had a proof, but it took another staggering 358 years of effort by mathematicians since then to prove the theorem. By the way, that proof was 129 pages long, which certainly meant it would not have fitted in the margin anyway. So Fermat was right about that part. To recap, Fermat's last theorem states that there are no positive integers a, b, and c satisfying the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n whenever n is greater than 2. This theorem is way too hard to prove in a YouTube video, so instead we'll be proving the polynomial version of this theorem, which states that there are no non-constant polynomials f, g, and h with complex coefficients such that f to the n plus g to the n equals h to the n whenever n is greater than 2. How do we prove this theorem? Pay attention to the proof because there is one part of the proof where we use a special property of polynomials that we often take for granted, and this will be the flaw in Lamy's proof for Fermat's last theorem. To prove this theorem, assume on the contrary that there are solutions, and note that we can assume f, g, and h to be relatively prime because we can always divide out any common factors. Let's also choose to examine the solution where the sum of degrees of f and g is minimal. Now here comes the substantial part. We let zeta denote the nth root of unity as shown. This will be a key tool in our proof. Now we observe that 1, zeta, zeta squared until zeta to the n minus 1 are all roots of the equation x to the n minus 1. So the equation x to the n minus 1 factorizes as shown. And now comes the next step which requires a bit of thought, so watch closely. The magic thing is by complete analogy with our factorization above, h to the n minus g to the n can therefore be factorized as shown. Why is this true? Look at the equation in blue and expand the right hand side. The coefficient of x to the n minus 1 is the negative sum of zeta powers, and by looking at the left hand side, we conclude that this sum is 0. Now look at the equation in green. The coefficient of h to the n minus 1 times g is again the negative sum of zeta powers, which we just concluded is 0. And similarly, for all the terms in between h to the n and g to the n, we can conclude that the coefficient is 0 by thinking about the analogous term in the blue equation. In any case, what we really want out of this factorization is that each of these factors are pairwise co-prime. It did a series of manipulations which we shall leave as an exercise to the viewer, shows that GCD of any two of them equals the GCD of g and h, which we assume to be co-prime. So now, what we have at the end of the day is that f to the n, which is h to the n minus g to the n, can be factorized as a product of co-prime factors. Now you may be familiar with the integer case that if you have a square number like 144, written as a product of two co-prime positive numbers a and b, then a and b must be squares. This is because the repeated factors cannot be shared across a and b. The case for polynomials is similar, which implies that each of the factors in the green box is the nth power of a polynomial. Just the first three equations is enough to give us a contradiction. And by the way, this is where the n greater than 2 hypothesis is used. We need at least three equations here to give us a contradiction. So now if you take the linear combination of the first two equations as shown, the left hand sides will line up with the left hand side of the third equation. This means that the same linear combination on the right-hand side of the equation will give us a relationship between p to the n plus q to the n equals r to the n. You might see where this is going. We can actually take the coefficients, uh, take the f root and absorb them into the polynomials, giving us an expression that looks exactly like our Fermat's last theorem statement. Except now, p 
and Q are sort of the nth roots of our previous polynomials, so the degrees are definitely smaller. This contradicts our earlier assumption about the minimal degrees. So now back to Lamy. What was his proof of the Fermat's last theorem? Well, essentially, he wanted to exploit a similar idea. We start with some co-prime as smaller solutions to the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. Working in a world where we have integers and the nth root of unity, we can similarly factorize a to the n as the product of terms which are pairwise co-prime. We can then similarly conclude that each term must be a nth power. And similarly get a contradiction where we obtain some smaller set of solution to the Fermat's equation. This sounds really good, so what's wrong with this situation? The gap is subtle and leads to some really interesting mathematics. Well, you see, a large, a key part of the proof is the claim that if an nth power is written as a product of terms that are co-prime, then each of the term must also be an nth power. This works for integers, it works for polynomials with complex coefficients, but this actually uses a special property that these two sets have, which is the, which is the property that these are unit factorization domains. Let me explain what this means. Let's start with the integers. Among the integers, there are certain numbers which we can think of as building blocks of integers, namely the primes. This is because any integer can be factorized up to plus minus 1 as a product of 0 or more primes. The prime numbers themselves cannot be further broken down, which is why they are called irreducible elements. The thing about integers is that each integer has only a unique way of being broken down into the product of irreducible elements, up to reordering of the elements. This is why the integers form a unique factorization domain. But wait, you might say that I can also write 6 as minus 2 times minus 3, and both minus 2 and minus 3 cannot seem to be broken down further. Indeed, the negative primes are also irreducible elements. But we actually make an identification to say that p and minus p are sort of the same thing, because we can convert one into another easily through multiplying some integer, in this case multiplying by minus 1. So after defining which representatives are considered the same, uniqueness is actually defined up to some choice of representative among same irreducibles, and also up to some choice of ordering of the elements. The story is the same for polynomials with complex coefficients. Where our irreducibles are degree 1 polynomials, and every polynomial can be uniquely factorized into irreducibles, again up to ordering of the factors and up to a choice of representative. In this case, note, recall that two rep irreducibles are considered the same if they can be interconverted by multiplying with things in our set. So in the integer case, it was the plus and minus pair that got uh, paired up as the same. But here, two polynomials are considered the same if one is a complex number multiple of the other. We usually choose the monic degree one polynomials as the default representative. This property of unit factorization should not be taken for granted. Let's look at something funky, like the set of integers with square root of minus 5 appended. Basically, this is the set of all numbers of the form a plus b square root minus 5, where a and b are integers. You can check that if you add, subtract, or multiply any two such numbers, you actually stay within this, this form. What's mind-boggling here is that we can write 6 as two completely different factorizations. One can check that 2, 3, 1 plus square root minus 5 and 1 minus square root minus 5 are all irreducible and they cannot be interconverted by multiplying some element of this funky set. So they are indeed different irreducibles. Now we can see where our key argument breaks down if we don't have unit factorization. Because here we can write the square number 36 as a product of two co-prime numbers, none of which are square numbers. So on March 1st, 1847, Lamy presented to the Paris Academy the outline of what he believed was a complete proof of Fermat's last theorem. 
But Lubiu immediately said that Lame's assumption about unit factorization in the set he was working with was not necessarily justified. And a couple of months later, Lubiu actually announced a proof by Kumar that demonstrated the unit factorization assumption indeed does not hold in general for Lame's proof. Kumar's work showed how unit factorization can somewhat be safe through some complicated shenanigans that we won't be able to cover in this video. But it means he was able to save the proof of Fermat's last theorem for a considerable large class of n, n power, which is still pretty pre impressive. His work on the complicated shenanigans also laid the foundation for what is today known as algebraic number theory. This is a branch of mathematics that uses the techniques of abstract algebra, such as the concept of unit factorization, in order to study integers and their generalization. So yup, I hope you have come to appreciate more deeply about the concept of factorization. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out other videos on my channel, drop a like, and subscribe for more. Comment below to share any fun facts you know about Fermat's last theorem, and I'll see you in the next video.